Hello everybody, I'm Tom Linsky and I wanted to give you an update on a project that my friends and I have been working on. It's actually been a while since I did my last video update on the project. I have been giving more frequent updates on my website, historicalfx.com, but since my audience has grown so much, I've had about 150,000 new subscribers since the last time I did an update. But first off, I wanna say welcome to everybody who subscribed in the last year. I assume you probably haven't heard about this project, so I'll start from scratch. My friends and I are making a virtual museum experience of the RMS Lusitania, the famous Cunard ocean liner that was torpedoed and sunk during the First World War. It wasn't the reason, it wasn't the catalyst that brought the United States into the war, but it certainly helped the United States decide which side it was going to be on. So what is a virtual museum experience? It's basically formatted like a video game, where you get to tour the ship inside and out, walk all of the decks, walk throughout the corridors, visit the different public spaces, a couple of the cabins. We're not building the whole ship, but a lot of the key historical parts. So you'll be able to see them recreated in fine detail and authentically because we have a big team of historians who are helping us out. On top of that, we will also have a real-time sinking of the ship. All terrifying 18 minutes will be recreated for the first time authentically. One of the reasons why I say for the first time, because it has been animated before, is because we're working with historians to actually piece together a detailed timeline of the events that happened. Other sinking ships like the Titanic have all been scrutinized for a century. So everyone knows what happened. Everyone already knows, more or less, the fine details and the order, almost down to the minute, of how the sinking unfolded. Sure, there's plenty to still learn, but at this point we're arguing over the finer details. Lusitania is just a muddy mess of what happened and when. So, for the first time, because even previous books have glossed over it, for the first time we're sitting down with these historians, a lot of whom you may recognize, including Tad Fitch, Mike Poirier, J. Kent Layton, Stuart Williamson, and we're sitting down and working with a lot of them to figure out exactly how it unfolded, and we will be recreating that as best as we can. If you tuned into our recent Titanic anniversary livestream, which I've been doing for the past decade, then you saw a very low resolution update of what we've been working on the Lusitania. YouTube unfortunately compresses live streams terribly, so you didn't get to see it all that clearly. You're about to see the same video, but a lot clearer. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we've been working on as an official update. And of course, the name of the project is Lusitania, the Greyhound's Wake. And I'll stick a direct link to the page on my website where you can find out more about it. But first, before going into the video update, I wanna give you two quick announcements that if you're excited about Lusitania the Greyhound's Wake, I think you'll be excited about these as well. First off, me and a couple of the other guys have actually been finalizing a book contract about the Lusitania that will be published in conjunction with this experience. A two-part history of the Lusitania which tells the full story and illustrates it vividly using historical photographs and our CGI recreations. It's not a self-published book, it's actually with a real publisher. I can't say too much more about it, but we were told that we could indeed tease it. So it's looking really good, even though the contracts aren't yet signed. The second thing, which I've also mentioned in a couple of my documentaries, is that J. Kent Layton and I have put together a musical album recreating classical ocean liner pieces. You heard some of it in the Collins Line series. We did recreations of the song about the Atlantic, the Atlantic's return, a song about the Adriatic, and a song about the Baltic. You also heard it in the Eastland documentary, as well as a couple classic White Star Line pieces and Cunard Line pieces, a couple of which are about the Lusitania and are gonna be in Lusitania, the Greyhound's Wake. Well, that album, called Liners of the Golden Era, a musical tribute, is actually already published. You can find it basically everywhere online that you want to buy music. Apple Music, YouTube Music, Amazon. I'll drop some of the more popular links in the description below. But I encourage you to buy it if you're interested in hearing those pieces in their entirety. There's two variations of each of the 20 songs, with one exception. 
but one variation is actually like a studio recording. It's a much clearer, crisper recording. The other is on antique pianos that are relevant to the period and relevant to the style of the piece. So if you want sort of like a vintage live feeling, you'll get that with the album. If you want a studio clean, clear recording, you'll also get that with the album. Included with that is also a book that Kent and I wrote, a PDF digital download. Not only does it give a description of how all of these pieces were recorded, but it breaks down the songs individually. It gives you a history of the artist, the context in which they were written, and a little bit about the ship, if the ship's history is relevant to the song. So it's a great piece. It's been reviewed by both Charles Haas, the president of the Titanic International Society, as well as John Altman, who was the historical consultant for the music of James Cameron's film. He basically produced all of the uh, onboard orchestra pieces. Check those out, but at this point I'm rambling and I'm tangenting. Let's jump in to that Lusitania reel. Our official logo for the project, I think this is actually the first time we're showing it on YouTube. The hull plating and the riveting is not actually modeled, since that would be insane for an experience like this, as we only afford you rare opportunities to push your face against the side of the ship. Instead, it's a texture that is made to look three-dimensional. Trust me, your computers will thank us. The texture is being made by Mike, and Levi's been dirtying it up with rust and algae and really making the ship look filthy, as it did in 1915. Now we move into the first class dining saloon. You'll notice that the exterior of the ship is connected seamlessly to the interior models, something that's extremely hard to do in recreations like this, as it requires every element of the ship being modeled precisely. It's not something that I've seen done before in recreations with this level of detail. The dining saloon was a lavish two-story room that could fit well over 400 passengers, all in one seating. Now the Lusitania historian in our audience may recognize this angle that we're recreating. Our background music, by the way, is all featured on the album that I mentioned earlier, Liners of the Golden Era, a musical tribute. Volume 1, by the way. Want to hear the songs without my ramblings over them? Again, check out the album in the links below. The saloon underwent changes during the ship's lifetime as society changed. Originally, the lower half of the saloon was mostly long tables, but as the years went on, it was changed to consist of mostly smaller tables for more personal meals. I guess people got sick of each other. Our recreation of Lusitania focuses on the ship's arrangement as she appeared on her final voyage, when she was torpedoed. So what you see here is how she looked when she went down. There's an alternative version where these menus are from Denny's, featuring the Greyhound Slam. As I mentioned earlier, the interior and exterior of the ship are fitted perfectly together, rather than the interior and the exterior existing in two different worlds, which is typically how it's done in games. Ready? Boom. Now bear in mind, not all of these spaces that you see are going to be playable. Some of these rooms lack furniture and are low detail, 
However, with that, you can look into every porthole and get a feel for what would have been there. It gives the ship all the more depth. It also means that if we later want to model that space, perhaps for an update, we already have the precise template we need to follow. We have now modeled nearly every main corridor for first class to allow you to explore even the far reaches of saloon class. All first class spaces that we intend to include are also complete. On an ocean liner like this, there's very few straight lines. The ship bows in the middle, which is referred to as shear, and the decks slope off to either side, which is called camber. It's a detail that's easy to omit in digital models like this, but we've built every single room on the ship with the proper degree of shear and camber. As I said, it's hardly noticeable, but when you're exploring the ship, you somehow feel it, even if it's not readily apparent in some of these spaces. It makes you feel like you're standing on a real ship and not a simulation. Since we're looking down a good portion of the length of the vessel, you can best notice the shear in angles like this. Each deck of Lusitania's first-class corridors had a slightly different style in wall panel arrangements. Since there are no known photographs of the first-class corridors outside of this area, the forward observation corridor, and a couple small glimpses into a few others, it was a real challenge for us to figure them all out and then build them. Oh, what a filthy window. I apologize. I'll get Levi right up here with a rag and have him clean it up. It was in this immediate area where the torpedo was first spotted heading towards the ship, and from the moment it was fired, there was absolutely nothing that the crew was able to do that would have changed the outcome. Welcome to the forecastle. The machinery up here is mostly finished, as are the masts and rigging, although we haven't yet imported the funnel stays, which you might notice the lack thereof in the distance. Where did Levi put the side of the ship? He better get that back on or we might capsize soon. Details are still being imported and textures finalized to say nothing about post-processing, which we've only barely worked on at the time of this footage, but these dollhouse cutaways give a good feeling of the enormity of both the ship and the undertaking of this museum recreation. You can peek a bit of third class as we fly through here. Most of the spaces that we intend to include in third class are also finished, and Alex has been finalizing the plumbing and wiring that you'd find throughout the promenades. Well, despite the starboard side being missing, she doesn't seem to be sinking. But don't worry, she will. I mentioned earlier that the first thorough minute-by-minute -minute breakdown of every known eyewitness testimony is being done, and our research document that we're compiling with our historians has long since surpassed 900 pages. Now you know where that aforementioned book contract comes from. But it's not just researching, though. We've been programming the sinking as well, and maybe we'll tease a little bit of it at the end of this video. We are coming up to second class which was actually overbooked on the final voyage. Early in the ship's career, it was found that the ship's 76,000 horsepower engines produced significant vibrations in this part of the vessel, so a lot of additional beams and pillars were added to strengthen this area. As we're focusing on the end of the ship's career, we'll be adding any of those modifications in places that we plan to include. Look at all those lifeboats. She had two different designs of lifeboats, plus two different designs of collapsible boats layered under them. 
Each design had to be researched so that we could recreate them authentically. You're able to see here the teardrop shape of the Lusitania, compared to the box-shaped Titanic and Olympic. The complexity of Lusitania, compared to these other ships, has presented many, many challenges for us since there really is no easy part of the ship to build. Everything has to fit a curved shape. The first class lounge, the marble fireplace, and Emma's fantastic painting. She actually painted that as a real legitimate oil painting, which we then scanned into this environment. She's done that a couple times for this project. The color of the marble that you see here is a faithful recreation based on a recovered section of this pillar. Alex put weeks into perfecting these carvings, as well as all carvings throughout First Class, to get them just right. Alex has done hundreds of carvings for Lusitania over the project. Probably no digital ship recreation in history has done so many unique carvings and cherubs. Alex is sleeping right now, as he should be. Lusitania sailing at night. Ignore the lack of forecastle detail, it must have fallen off while we were sailing through the Grand Banks. It happens. Now you see here every porthole and window is lit up bright on the ship, since we've stuck a room behind each one. On the final night of the crossing as she approached Ireland, Captain Turner ordered that the ship be completely blacked out and every window and light hidden, in order to avoid detection by U-boats. The reading and writing room, significantly refined since you last saw it a year ago. I don't know what the lads have planned, but I'm told that Alex is adding something to this room in the next few days that will blow my mind. So this is what it looks like now. This is what the space looked like only a year ago. Quick, let's run along the boat deck and see if we can sneak up onto the bridge. You'll notice all of the extra collapsible lifeboats that were added to the Lusitania after the Titanic sank. Cunard spent tens of thousands of pounds to add the new collapsible boats to the ship because, like the Titanic, and every other ship of the time, Lusitania didn't have enough lifeboats for all on board in 1912. By the time of the Lusitania sinking, she did. However, when she went down, these extra collapsibles proved to be almost useless. The bridge was completely redone, both models and textures, most of which by our friend Gavrielle. We didn't replace the helm yet, but we will. Sheesh, Levi really better get up here and clean these windows too. How can you drive this thing? Okay, good, we're back inside where it's a bit warmer. This is the ship's main first class stairwell. It's grand staircase, if you will. It has been polished up a lot over the last year, but we're still going to be getting that post-processing right later. The interior textures are all finished, so things like the carpet design, wall paneling, and floors are just about wrapped up. If we go through those doors, we'd step outside. But nah, let's go this way. Back into the first class saloon, this time the upper floor.
that open doorway would lead into the galley, if we had built it. In addition to the saloon, we've heavily modified the old models for the lounge and smoke room, which will look incredible once we show them off. We've also been doing benchmark tests to make sure performance is good for even mid-level computers. Even with the intense syncing that we're developing, it should be an enjoyable experience for most people. Unless, of course, you're still running the same old Windows 98 that you used to play Railroad Tycoon 2 on. Now, we are nearing the conclusion of this project. And, of course, after almost three years of working on the Lusitania, we're very excited to be working on something else. For about a year now, we've been laying the groundwork for our next virtual museum experience. And it's another shipwreck. It is one that is somewhat well known, but it still does not get the attention that it deserves. In the past year, we've been working with historians and museums to make sure that this project is going to be thoroughly researched and just as authentic as the Lusitania one. We're going to the wreck site and we're even hoping to get divers in the water at it. Now, I think in one of my earlier streams on my channel, we actually did say what our next project is going to be, but still, unless you find that, I'm not going to confirm the name of the ship, but I will tell you that she was once called the Queen of the Seas, but um, I don't think Queen's very appropriate. I don't think Princess is appropriate. Empress. You know what? I think Empress is the most appropriate title for her. Here you are able to see the incredible detail that has been going into the ship with the outline of all of her rooms. Every last window and every last porthole has at least some sort of room behind it, so you really can look into every window and see at least something. While we've been working with so many wonderful historians on this project, we've been drawing on a massive archive of original source material. But of course, we can't help but draw inspiration from Ken Marshall's famous 1994 painting. 